Let us pray. And now our gracious and heavenly Father, be pleased to let us preach, not for fame nor reputation, but to the end that we will be strengthened and believe and come closer to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. My, what a joy and what a thrill it is to be back at Moody. I always like to come to Moody because of who you think you are. <laughs> there was this discussion <clears throat> carried on by three different uh, Bible colleges, students, and they were discussing where would Jesus attend if he were here on earth. And one said, of course, he would enroll at the School of Divinity at Harvard University because he certainly is an intellectual. Another one said, no, he would go to Wheaton, the Vatican of evangelicalism. <laughs> and then the one from Moody said, I'd like to ask a question before I answer it. Why would he change his enrollment? He's already at Moody. <laughs> so I like to come for who you think you are. I'm honored indeed to again be asked to come to this Hollywood place, this place where your assembly and other assemblies have hollowed these grounds to the glory of God. I'm particularly pleased to be here. Dr. Sweeten did not tell you that uh, we dismissed that. As a matter of fact, he was on, he, was, he got worried because he was on to be at MacArthur at 6.30. And at 2 o'clock, we hadn't given the benediction. And so he began to get a little worried as to whether he was going to make the night service or not. But we were more than happy to have had him, and his message lives on forever. I am so glad to be here with Robin. I knew that, uh, you know, that this austere program was going on at Liberty. And, uh, and if anybody has a suit his size. kind of overalls he has, I wear them about once a week. But I was out on the parking lot with my overalls on, just like you, and uh, with my coat on. And a man came up and said, is this where Dr. Hill pastor? I said, yes. They said, is he in? I said, yes. <laughs> they said, can you take us to him? I said, yes. <laughs> and as we walked, he said, you keep things looking pretty nice around here. <laughs> And I said, I try. <laughs> and I took him in the office and I said, now be seated. And then I went around on the other side and said, and I said, now what can I do for you? He said, wait a minute. Are you Evie Hill? I said, in these are pajamas. I'm still Evie Hill. <laughs> now the real explanation to Rob is there are a few of us who know. I see a few of us here. The real explanation to Robert's singing is he's out of the South. And that's where we were headquartered for a long time. <laughs> Let me finish it. And two million of us are passing for white. That's why we always know what white folks are doing. We have, we have two million Negroes in the United States who are passing for white. And they keep us in contact one with another. And the way you can tell is every now and then you hear the twang in the voice. <laughs> you can't get that by training. 
That has to be inborn in you. Dr. Sweeting, Dr. Sweeting, we pray for you as you, as he has said, you enter your new career now. Uh, everybody will want him as a singer and uh, use him as a preacher. When was God at his best? When was God at his best? Some will say without hesitation, Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it'd be very difficult when one considers the heavens and the earth. It would be very difficult not to agree that that was God at his back. If one starts driving across the United States and if he leaves the West Coast with all of its charm and beauty with that unmatched Western sunset and with the waters of the Pacific beating against the beautiful shores of California and move across the desert picturesque land of New Mexico and Arizona and come to the land of my birth, Texas and see the rolling hills mountains of the hilltops bedecked by several oak trees and on last month drive through Texas with the blue bonnets topped by the Indian paintbrushes one would say whoever made the earth was at his best and if one would leave Texas and go through the bowels of Louisiana and the plain lands plus the pine land of Mississippi, on across the peach state of Georgia to the second most sunny state in the world, Florida. and then come up the East Coast and go on to that picturesque part of our country called New England, one would have to say Genesis 1 and 1 was God at his best. When one beholds the heaven and realizes that there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on the ocean banks. And yet they move in an organized fashion. They move within their circuit and in their orbit. When one recognizes that there are other planets with their own peculiarities and they keep that distance. When one realizes that the sun is set exactly at the right tilt, to tilt at a small degree in either direction would freeze or burn up 
the inhabitants of the earth, one would have to say that when God created the heavens and the earth, God was at his best. But may thank not. May thank not. Because Genesis 1, 26 gives us even a greater appreciation for God. For Genesis 1, 26 says, And God said, Let us make man. Man. This image and likeness of God. Man this walking and talking creature, man whose very eyeball is so complex until scientists are baffled by it, man and his mind who builds skyscrapers at the very exact inch where even on the 90th floor there is no division in the wall because somebody created by God has the ability to build a 99-story building and it all comes together without a half inch off. Man, God made him. Man and his ability to take out the brain of a man and work on it and cut it and operate on it and pull malignant tumor out of it. Man. Man and his ability to paint. Man and his ability in poetry. Man and his ability to bring into being that which was not. Or rather to gather that together riding on this 747, crossing that mighty Atlantic. Top of the tail to the bottom, six stories high, the length of a football field. And I'm flying across the Atlantic Ocean on a football field six stories high. Man. Can make it touch down almost to the second. And now they have these this idea of letting it manually or rather rather computerize landing, which I don't like. I was on a flight and the captain of the flight recognized me and he came out. And he said, Dr. Hill, I said, yes. He said, well, I'm captain of the flight, and I started shaking. I, he said, I just wanted to come back and meet you. I said, man, we can do that after we land. Get back. Get back to your post. And we can conclude that it was not when he created the heavens and the earth, but we can easily argue that God was at his best when he made man. But me think not. There in the passage of scripture where God prepares to redeem man. Because even though God created the heavens and the earth, something happened back yonder in the garden that affected the earth. And affected the heavens. So that the peace and the tranquility that we used to know in the garden no longer exists. Before Adam fell, there was no hot weather. 
Before Adam fell, there were no smashing, destructive tornadoes. Before Adam fell, the bee did not sting. Before Adam fell, there was no drought. Before Adam fell, there was no need that was not met. And so wherein I have great appreciation for God creating the heavens and the earth and making man, I move the greater as I see this great plan of redemption starting at the gates of Eden. And as he walks across 4,000 years from loss to redemption, and as he impregnates history with 323 prophecies concerning the coming of our Messiah. And then, while shepherds watch their sheep by night, an angelic course swung out in history and declared that it has happened. And we go on down to Bethlehem, and we go to a manger, a stable, and we look in a manger, and we see the Messiah born. That's God has to be at his best. And then the life of Christ crosses every T and dots every I, fulfills all prophecy. That has to be God at his best. But me think not. I watched Jesus. For Jesus was God incarnated. And as I watch God in Jesus, turning water to wine. Giving sight to the blind. Healing at his word. Causing the dead to rise. And walking on water as if it were dry land. It occurs to me in my spirit that Jesus who was and is God living among us doing mighty works and miracles is God at his best. What could be better than him saying to Lazarus, come forth? What could be better than him giving sight to the blind? So I moved to believe that it was during his earthly ministry where he did so many miracles. That that was God in Christ at his best. But me think not. Because I'm also overcome by this death on Calvary. I like the way my old preacher used to put it. He swung between two eggs are two bosses, earth and heaven. I like the way the old preacher put it. They stretched him wide. They raised him high. They dropped him low. And when he dropped, hell shook and heaven shook and earth shook and grave tops flew open. And the dead walked around on earth. That's got to be God at his best. And on that cross, I heard him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so it's this whole matter of Calvary and the death of Calvary. I join in with that centurion. Surely this must be, and this is, the Son of God. 
soul. It was a death, substitutionary death on Calvary. It was him enduring the agony of the sins of all men of all times on Calvary. That was God at his best. But me thank God. For you see, we have had footsteps into graveyards before. Abraham's steps leads to the graveyard. Isaac's steps leads to the graveyard. My mama's steps leads to the graveyard. So we've got to go a little further. Because if we have only steps leading into the graveyard, then we have no hope. And so it was not his death on the cross that was God at his best. But it was early Sunday morning when he conquered both death, hell, and the grave and got up with all power in his hand and announced that I am he who was dead. But I'm alive forevermore. He informs us that paradise has been translocated from the bosom of the earth to the presence of God. That we no more linger in the bosom of the earth, but we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. And he says, and I have the key. That has to be. That's it. Nothing compared. The hope of us rests in the fact that he has risen. So God at his best has to be the resurrection. For there's something else that catches my attention over there in John, the 21st chapter, that that just blows my mind. I I, I recognize who I'm preaching to. I I know that there is nothing like that resurrection, but let's walk a little bit further. And guess what we find in the 21st chapter of the book of John? Beginning about that 15th verse. We find a preacher who messed up. Whose denomination required that he turn in his license. Who had received a special invitation from Jesus by the women, go tell my disciples and Peter. Be sure to tell Peter, because I know him, he will exclude himself from the meeting. Be sure to tell Peter that cursing, swearing, denying Peter, who deserves no more pulpit, be sure to tell Peter that I won't talk with him. And in my sanctified mind, I know what Peter thought when he got the invitation. Peter said, this is it. This is it. This is it. I just might as well pack up all of my license and everything because this is it. And uh, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna make a public spectacle out of me by kicking me out of the kingdom because I've denied him. I've cursed. And yet, he said, Peter, the matter that I wish to discuss with you, do you love me? And the great God who is holy, the great 
God who is pure took time to say to a fallen discredited brother feed my sheep and that's why I think this is God at his best because I can relate to this I can I can testify to this I, this this helps me here I can go tell it on the mountain that there is a God who is a God of justice, but don't forget his love. And that he was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself and all everyone. Come. Here bring your wounded heart. I can say to the transvestite that I accepted into our church as a candidate for baptism, God loves you. And then he got up and said, may I testify? And I said, yes. He said, I just want to say, anybody got any idea like this, see me. So I want to tell you, don't come this way. I can say to Dorothy, who was a hooker on the streets, and we witnessed to her and she accepted Christ. I can say, Dorothy, God loves you. As a matter of fact, he gave me a message and said, and Dorothy. Because God who created the heavens, that's too much for me. I cannot conceive that. I can't build a dog house, so I can't relate to the God who created the heavens. The God who made me, I can't relate to that. I've got a doctor, I've got several doctors. I have a neurologist and a specialist and a eye specialist and a foot specialist because I can't relate to the interests of mankind. But when you talk about God talking to a sinner, I can relate to that. And so, it was when the creator of God, the sustainer of God, talked to a backsliding preacher. And instead of excluding him, gave him the privilege to preach the Pentecostal message. On Pentecost, God was at his best. Me think not. No, 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 no. I appreciate what he did for Peter. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But that wasn't when he was at his best. Would y'all like for me to wrap this up and tell you when he was at his best? It was down in Sweet Home Community. Nine miles from Seguin, 12 miles from Geronimo, 14 miles from Queen McQueenie, when God came to Sweet Home and came to my heart and entered my life and saved my soul and turned me around. That's when God was at his best.